Welcome to episode 56 of The Social Scientist. My name is Keith McIntosh. I am now finally a PhD candidate in sociology. I'm over at Temple University in Philadelphia, and I'm here with my esteemed colleague. I'm uh, Dr. Kip Trentonio, psychologist. <laughs> psychologist extraordinaire. Extraordinaire. Uh, so, Keith, today we're going to be talking about Joe Rogan, the epitome of masculinity for the 21st century. Says who? Says me. No, says uh, this, I guess we're going to figure out if we if we agree on that or not today. Fair enough. Fair enough. So when did Joe Rogan come to your attention, Kip? I think probably with literally with Fear Factor. I mean, uh, he was on that show way back in the day. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, so that's when. Um, but when he really came into my attention, of course, was in podcasting world mm -hmm. with the Joe Rogan experience with his very uh, psychedelic, psychedelic, uh, psychedelic kind of trippy little uh, Joe Rogan experience head, you know, that yeah. I see so often on my phone. So anyway, how about you, Keith? I remember him from, from Fear Factor, but I didn't know who he was. He wasn't like significant to me. He just seemed kind of like a bro on TV. And, but I remember coming across the Joe Rogan experience like fairly early on. I wish I could tell you exactly what episode um, I heard, like mm -hmm. when I heard about it, but I feel like I was one of the few kind of in the know early on. And yes. it was just, a, I don't know what he said that stood out to me now, but there was something probably about like uh, psilocybin or some kind of hippy dippy thing. But it was uh -huh. a weird, it was a weird cross fertilization between like this bro who's into like lifting weights and then this kind of like sensitive, like, you know, hippie stuff. And it was like interesting to me. And even though it wasn't quite my style, he like planted a seed in my brain. And I would go back every so often on YouTube, go to the Joe Rogan experience and, and listen to the, an episode. And, uh, and I just kind of thought it was like this sidebar thing that would fade away, whatever. And it's just been a trip to watch his show grow and grow and grow. And now it's like this, you know, national, international phenomenon. I kind of can't believe it actually. Yeah. Yeah, on a recent episode, uh, somebody actually told him he he is the Johnny Carson of our generation now that people tune in <laughs> every day to listen to him speak. And it really has transcended, too. I mean, it's to the point where it's not just like people were hip to the Internet um, at this point talking about him. It's like I'm hearing middle aged people talk about him. I've heard older people talk about him, mm. uh, talk about watching his show, listening really? to his show. Yeah, absolutely. And then it's really interesting because he's he really defies kind of either being right wing or left wing. He kind yeah. of has characteristics of both. Um, so there's this weird element where you like very right wing people like him, but then also very left wing people kind of like him as yeah, well. That's true. So he's found he's found a way to traverse our very dodgy political climate that we live in now, which is I mean, that in itself is a testament to his ability and his personality. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also like, that's to do all that. And then to also be incredibly entertaining and the range of guests he has, you know, like one day he'll have some like evolutionary biologist on, and then the next day it's Joey Diaz, yeah. right. Who's like this, like <laughs> chubby Cuban Italian comedian who's highly inappropriate. And he somehow can like interact and navigate both relationships in a way that's like highly entertaining. Mm -hmm. So yeah, pretty interesting guy. Yeah, I feel like, like you mentioned he's sort of has characteristics of the left and characteristics of the right. I mm -hmm. think that's a huge reason why I like him, to be honest, because I feel like we're so yeah. balkanized politically. And I'm like mm -hmm. all my friends are really liberal and but I feel more moderate. And it's been interesting. So I kind of feel like a little bit of a fish out of water. And, and I think, you know, you can you can learn to speak a certain kind of way with certain kinds of people and like the virtue signaling, whether it's on the left or the right, for that matter. Um, mm -hmm. You communicate to people who think like you that you're one of them. And I think people do that constantly. It's just we are tribal creatures. And there's something right. really liberating about being able to say, no, I'm into this kind of hippie shit on the left. But then I also have certain values that are on the right. And it takes a certain kind of person, a certain strength of character, but also kind of like a, a wide awake mind that's mm -hmm. willing to break through traditional boundaries and develop a sense of self that comes from both sides. And I find that just super encouraging, and I relate to that a lot. And I suspect a lot of people feel the same way. Right. And I would agree with that, too. Uh, one of the ways that I think he identifies, maybe people on the right tend to identify with him more, is through what kind of one of the main parts of our topic today is, is Joe Rogan, to me, is this very hyper-masculine 
character, but not in like an Arnold Schwarzenegger or John Wayne kind of like this, like I have no brains and I'm all <laughs> m- muscle and might and I don't, all I do is fight and everything. He, he kind of personifies this new era of masculinity mm-hmm. where on one hand, he is this very smart, intellectually engaged person who knows about science and can do, um, you know, can tell you like the chemical breakdowns of uh, cannabis and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of how affected brain and have a conversation with a, you know, like I said, an evolutionary biologist or a geneticist, you know, mm-hmm. on the other hand, he is like a skilled fighter who is also the boss of, or not the boss, but like the main announcer.
Nobody mm-hmm. like has the time to be like, I smoke weed and I'm highly productive and I'm hilarious and I can kick your ass and I'm like the, you know, like you, mm-hmm. nobody can do all of those things at once. I mean, clearly he can, but he's like a freak of nature to be mm-hmm. able to do that. I was so going to ask you about that. Yeah, go ahead. How, how much is that a freak of nature? Like how often as a psychologist, is that really atypical to see people with a kind of a manifested personalities in these different domains? I think it's pretty atypical. I mean, I mean, I think what what Joe Rogan really represents is what we would call the theory of general intelligence, which is if you're intelligent in one domain, you're probably intelligent in all domains. Mm -hmm. So there's this thing called the G factor, which is like our IQ. And the idea some people believe in like what it's called a multiple intelligence, which is like you can be a genius at music, but terrible at math but like really good with your hands, right? But uh, a lot of the research doesn't support that. It would instead support that there's a general intelligence and it either goes up or down, which is why we give somebody like an IQ score instead of giving them, you know, like 15 different scores on different types of intelligence. Now, given the IQ, just to be accurate, the IQ score is made out of subdomains of intelligences, of intelligences. But for the most part, we pay more attention to the kind of the collective intelligence. So the fact that like he's a good at stand up comedy and has like that kinetic intelligence of being a fighter and has the intelligence to kind of break down science, um, that would be very supportive of that kind of a figure. I think what's interesting is that you have somebody who has the ability to optimize all those things. Yeah. Right. A lot yeah. of people have the potential. Like Keith, you're a very smart guy. My, my guess is if you sat down and wrote jokes for like three weeks, you'd probably come up with some pretty good stuff. But like, you just don't have time to like figure that out and develop that skill yeah. set. Yeah. But it's funny though. Like, it's not as if he has more hours in his week than I do. I mean, I think it's just. I guess he uses it more uh, efficiently. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, he's a better man than I. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I mean, that's for sure. I mean, he's, if I had one tenth of his probably work ethic, I would yeah. be a pro- prolific researcher and psychologist. Uh, so that's, a, yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for that for sure. Yeah. Is that, is that the difference though? You think it's just an issue of, I, I, he, he always says grinding. He's like, I know how to grind. I know how to just keep mm-hmm. moving forward. Do you think that's the issue? Grit, grind, making the most of your hours? Um, I think so. There's a, there's another book and I can't remember the um, the name of it right now, but there's another book that I was reading about a Navy SEAL, and it's not Jocko Willink. It's uh, this other guy, and he was actually on Joe Rogan, which is how I heard of the, the it's book. Not that um, David uh, Goggin guy. David Goggins, yeah, right. I was reading his book, and he just talks a lot about like for your ability to run, like he runs ultra marathons, right, mm-hmm. which is something Joe Rogan frequently talks about, is like the ability to do those kind of extreme things. He also holds like the pull up record for the world or is like second place. So he talks about the like the ability to learn to tolerate distress in that way is like a skill and a muscle that you have to develop. So like when he runs those ultra marathons at David Goggins, he doesn't do it with, with headphones. So he just runs the entire time without headphones because he has built that skill of like keeping his mind occupied and like being able to work through the distress and not talking himself out of work. Mm -hmm. which is what you know most of us do like you see get me on the treadmill for 25 minutes and by the 25th minute i'm like oh my knee hurts my leg like there's all these reasons i better stop i don't want to be tired i don't you know (laughs) like i'll come up with all kinds of reasons why i shouldn't do that so my guess is that joe rogan has also developed that aptitude to kind of work through things you know yeah yeah i find it inspiring Mm-hmm. I mean, I can sometimes I've been at like the gym and, you know, maybe I listen to a podcast the day before or earlier that day and I can feel myself like, you know, Keith, go a little bit further, go a little bit further, push yourself a little bit more. Right. I mean, right. it feels good, you know, and I, I don't know, like I don't want to be too, uh, you know, worshiping of anyone, but I think it's a positive message to try to, to find yeah. out where your limits are and to push yourself. I mean, it is like there's no way around it. Like if you want to figure out what you're capable of, there's only one way to do that, which is to kind of push and keep at it, right? Yeah, I think so too, but I I guess just to play devil's advocate really quick, what I what I would say is a little bit dangerous about it is that it kind of sets up like a false expectation, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like it's like you should, if you're not running hills every single day, you're not, you know, you're not doing it. Well, not everybody has like the genetic capacity or the ability to do something like that, 
right? Or like not everybody has the the intellectual ability to like get that into science and understand it. Mm -hmm. And so I think like for sometimes it can be really like highly motivating and everything. On the other hand, I could also see like a guy who smokes weed every day and doesn't do anything, but totally justifies it as like, oh, Joe Rogan smokes weed every day and he's like amazing. So obviously weed doesn't affect motivation at all, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which totally know it does. I mean, from psychology, there's zero doubt about it. For some people, it doesn't. Some people get like more productive on it, of course. Yeah. But, um, but I, yeah, I wouldn't say that. So I think it can be a little, I don't want to say dangerous. That's an extreme word, but it can create like a false expectation. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I see it as like an ideal kind of, you know, like you need some sort of, like, I'm, I'm never going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, but you could have like a poster of him on your wall as a kind of ideal, like, uh, when yeah. you're lifting weights like this is the the extreme you know move in that direction like that kind of thing same thing with intellectuals or prolific writers like i'm always amazed by um someone like stephen king you know who seems to knock out a novel every week like the people who have crazy work ethics um i mm -hmm. do find it inspiring so i kind of like the fact that he's uh, you know what another thing i like is the fact that he's successful in these different domains it's odd because usually in life to be number one in one domain requires complete uh, dedication to just that one domain. Because mm -hmm. if you're splitting your time between like two or three or four or five s things, like how right. are you ever going to be number one? So one thing that's just super impressive is that he's managed to be an, you know, an impressive person in these different areas. And I, I kind of like that quality too, that you don't have to like be a slave to only like, you know, like working out or only reading or I, I like the, it feels like a well-rounded life. Like it seems like he's got a well-rounded life, but it's also extreme in its own way. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's really interesting. I never thought about that, that it, it's extremely well-rounded. <laughs> right. Why? And I, I, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. Actually, I don't think it's like, I wouldn't say because there's no, there's nothing he really does is in a moderate level. Mm. Right. So it's kind of like he's pushing the gas pedal all the way down on everything. Like nobody does as much podcasting as Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. He does three hours every day, sometimes five mm -hmm. days a week. Right. Nobody like if he doesn't just hunt, you know, he's not going out pheasant hunting a couple times a year. He's like elk hunting in Montana, <laughs> which is like the most extreme <laughs> version of that. He's like he's not just working out. He's running up hills. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? That's like, that's like you, you take the essential oil of the worst part of a run yeah. and he's like, like, yeah, let's just optimize that. Let's like take that and amplify that <laughs> as many times as possible. It is kind of ridiculous. So it's it, there's of, nothing like a, to me. It, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say he's like a cartoon character in a way. I mean, it's kind of, it is ridiculous. Like I love the guy, but it's, it's sort of yeah. it's so over the top that it's like, it's ridiculous. Right. And then, you know, sometimes sometimes he'll do this thing that I think is really funny where he'll he'll be talking about a lit like a list of things that you have to do if you're like feeling depressed. Uh -huh. And he'll just and he'll just say like these things like they're completely normal. He'll be like, you know, you just you got to be outdoors. You got to do something that's like kind of like you got to go elk hunting. You got to be running hills. You got to be doing your Brazilian jiu jitsu. And I'm just like, like most people have like this nine to five job. Yeah. Where like at the end of the day they have to like run to IKEA mm -hmm. and like build a piece of furniture, you know, at night. They don't really have the ability to like <laughs> like have you ever, that's kind of their you know. Have you ever caught yourself like like just get, like David Goggin has those videos where he's like running, you know, sweats pouring down. Have you ever caught yourself like, you know, eating popcorn or like just snacking and just being like lazy and then you like watch a video like that and you get like a you get like a buzz or a thrill from the video cuz you're like, yeah, yes. yeah, I could do that. But at the same yeah. time you're also like enjoying your meal and just like chilling yeah. out. And you yeah, realize that's... just how silly it is. Like it's not uh you can use it as fuel to go out and run yourself, but there's like a weird way that some of these videos are just kind of like also disposable and like consumed for their like transitory pleasure and not not as like an authentic substantive way of like changing your life right yeah no, no, I, I find myself in that situation quite often i think like, uh, especially when i listen to different podcasts and i'm like oh i want to learn about that or like i'm really pumped up on that you know like i'll i'll listen to uh, something about there was a recent podcast of joe rogan's it was about like aging right and it's talking about all these different chemicals. And there's literally a moment where Joe Rogan is like writing down the different chemicals that 
like the geneticist <laughs> guy is telling him and the same like you know he's like planning on taking these chemicals in mm-hmm. order to like re- like you know make his life longer and it kind of makes me like oh maybe i should think about doing that yeah, yeah. and of course like then i like finish on the treadmill go home and make some chicken wings and eat them <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like and that's the end of my day you know there's like no congruency or follow through yeah. so, so so where did he it, I feel like he's a what's the I don't like a fun, like a some like fungus that spread under the ground and yes. then just sprung up everywhere. Like yes. where did the turn come when he went from being kind of underground to being like this sort of like canonical figure at least among mm. certain people. I would say where it's really happened is in the last like 3 or 4 years and it's it's to me part of it is just the nonstop river of productivity eventually he's going to tap into everything so for example he has his primary live channel that he puts on every day right and that's just kind of is what it is but then he has what i think is more powerful which is the joe rogan experience clips channel Mm -hmm. which is like for anybody who's just scrolling through youtube you know if you have enough guests and you have enough people and you spread yourself out across enough topics people are eventually going to find you. So like if I'm looking up a musician and eventually Joe Rogan's had that musician, I'm going to be, I'm going to be interested in him. If I'm interested in elk hunting, right. Or hunting, I'm eventually going to run into him. If I'm interested in motivation or beating depression or uh, let's say um, comedy, right. He has all these different people. So his, like, it's exactly what you said. It's like this moss that kind of covers all these different areas. And it's almost impossible, I would say, to find a subject that hasn't been talked about on Joe Rogan at this point. Yeah. Like, I mean, he he covers politics. He covers, like, sports to some degree at times. He covers, like, UFC. Like, there's so many different avenues to get into Joe Rogan that inevitably Mm -hmm. everybody's going to follow him. And that's what I think happens. And then he sucks you in with how good of an interviewer is and how funny he can maintain himself and how Mm -hmm. funny and interesting he can be for like three hours. Yeah. It's like he is the internet in a way. It's like the web of Rogan. You know, he connects like all, he connects all these people, people from the left, people from the right, people who are Mm -hmm. into hunting, people who run marathons, scientists, like physicists. What was that? Something fell. Your crew, your whole, uh, your whole situation's fallen down? Yeah, don't worry about it. Keep going. <laughs> but I just think, I find it interesting because it's like this whole network of, of associations now that kind of, it's like, what, five degrees of Kevin Bacon? You know, it's yeah. like a five degrees, like one degree of Rogan. You can just connect everything in the world by this one person. And the other thing <laughs> is, is he, he's been, un, and this is something you, you and I talked about before the show, but he's like uncompromising in his format. And that is really interesting. My guess is he could have the biggest celebrities in the world on like every day of the week if you wanted to at this point. Um, but he just has not moved on the format of like he's going to have a scientist. He's going to have a comedian. He's going to have his fight companion episodes where you like watch it as you're watching UFC. He just is continuing to divide the audience as opposed to like he could probably have a huge celebrity on every single day. But he mm-hmm. doesn't do that. And I think that's really interesting. And then the other part is that he just hasn't changed the format of the show or yeah. taken it to television. Yeah. You know, so it becomes this very consistent thing that everybody has like come to depend on. Like I know every Monday, if I open my podcast app, there's going to be an episode for me to listen to because yeah. I, you know, I I can't listen to that much. It's almost comical. Like he, like I usually I run out of podcasts to listen to. It's like but with Joe Rogan. I mean, you never do it's like i like i can never <laughs> even one episode sometimes i can't make it through in a week yeah yeah it's just that much content so the thing that i really like about him too is or at least the thing that i notice, and i've noticed this recently if you watch an old clip of his he's like he's way smarter and less aggressive now than like five years ago or maybe right. you know further back like he's he used to, he, he went on rants, like on uh, Opie and Anthony's show about, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff, like, you know, whatever, 9-11 and, you know, mm-hmm. not not ever landing on the moon, like faking the the videos from the moon landing, mm-hmm. um, just all sorts of stuff. Like he was somebody who was not, you know, grew up in like a different way, didn't go to college or like left without graduating, um, was in, you know, Hollywood, Fear Factor, all this stuff. It was not like sitting, reading academic books, not that you should be or you need to be, but he was just like a wild, uh, like super excitable, you know, naturally intelligent 
person and then kind of like finding you know random shit that he was interested in along the way which is a great way to learn but it's not like you know the you don't learn the canonical things and i feel like now because of how the podcast is launched and how and the fact that he's he's going toe to toe with physicists and biologists and all these interesting people and he has you know three hours to hammer away at their beliefs um, right. and, and they to, to him he's kind of transformed into a far far more um not more intelligent but like a more sensible person and i find right. that really um that too i think is like a great quality in someone because a lot of people just go like this is who i am this is what i believe and here's mm -hmm. my you know menu options that i will always offer to you it's a totally different way of living to continually like throw pieces of you away when you realize they're not working anymore and then grow new pieces and he does that. And I think that's like a really admirable quality. It's a really interesting form of education that you'd like never think of. You know, we're, we're so ingrained in the way we think about, you know, learning. Mm -hmm. Like you got to go take a class and you have to have homework and everything. But there, there really isn't anything wrong with just sitting there. If you if you got the opportunity to talk to smart people or clever people or interesting people every day for three hours, would that not be better than a college degree? The reason Oxford is considered one of the best universities is because every every student gets one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So you basically get to just sit with like a tremendously smart person and they pour over your essays and they talk you through the material and if you have issues they like address those particular issues. So your education is catered to you. So you get a great education. So Rogan is kind of like going going to college like you know his podcast right. in some ways is just him like receiving a fantastic education. One and that's, I mean, a lot of times, too, because I think people identify with him so much, he asks the questions that you would probably ask in that situation. Or he goes after the thing that comes up, and he's bold enough to say it a lot of times. So I think people also kind of jump into, like, the it's almost like Joe Rogan avatar, you know, where you're able to, like, live through him and ask the questions that he's going to ask. And it almost frustrates you when he takes it to a different direction. And you're like, oh, like, I wish you would have dove into that a little bit more, talked about that a little bit more yep. before you guys moved mm -hmm. on. So, yeah, it is a bizarre thing to think about getting an education in that way. Because most of the time, if you listen to some, like, I, I'll listen to podcasts from Yale and fancy colleges. And they're great. But it's also like, it's like, if you hear two smart people talking they're mm -hmm. kind of in the, they're a little bubble. And so they ask questions on a high level. And again, there's like a place for that, but uh, you're not really like, there, there are issues that are not going to be addressed that are just implied or taken for yes. granted. But because he's like, quote unquote, a normal guy, he, and he's also like a confident person. He's just kind of like a naturally bold person. He's willing to ask dumb questions basically. But you know, actually everybody wants to ask that question it's not a dumb question it's just a, you know it's a question that maybe an academic wouldn't ask and it and it creates a fantastic conversation because you get a super informed nerdy person being interviewed mm -hmm. and then you get kind of just this normal dude like just kind of poking around like why, why do you believe this why do you believe that and if he doesn't understand something he's not going to pretend that he does out of embarrassment and like move mm -hmm. along he'll be like whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute wait, you, you said this and he said this but that doesn't make sense and he'll like keep hammering until he understands or until the other person relents that what they said actually didn't make all that much sense in the first place and that's like a beauty to watch that's like real it's i mean it's like two you know human beings figuring shit out in real time it's a good right. thing to see yeah when i think about i also i would say though that there's value to both ends of that so like on one hand i think there is like you have the less informed person being interviewed by the more informed person or excuse me yeah interviewing the more informed person i also think that like if you listen to something like pod saves america which is like essentially two extremely liberal very smart people kind of going back and forth really really quick and like deconstructing everything from like a very particular point of view that can be entertaining as well and i can get satisfaction out of that but it's absolutely right that there's like the conflict that makes it interesting isn't there mm -hmm. and it's much more catering to my own confirmation bias i'm like yeah yeah that feels good that's exactly what i think <laughs> right and so it doesn't it doesn't feel the same or it doesn't produce the depth that i think the joe rogan experience produces you walk away from it feeling like whoa that was like really interesting you think about that afterwards versus with something like pod saves america 
I'll listen to it. At the end of it, I'll be like, okay, yeah, that's like this week's news. I put no thought into it. Yeah, I remember listening to Joe Scarborough interview Christopher Hitchens, and mm-hmm. Hitchens was doing his kind of like sassiness, and Scarborough said something like, we want more uh, light and less heat, Chris, Christopher, and he was like, mm-hmm. light only comes from heat. That was his rhetoric. <laughs> But apparently that's true. And like there is something to that metaphorically, too. Like there is something about uh, intellectual combat that is really healthy. But it requires like a, it requires two people being very civilized. You have to sit with someone who you disagree with and, you know, emotionally you want to like scream at them and, you know, they feel the same way about you. But you both agree in this domain you're going to put those feelings away and you're going to like just talk to each other and you, you'll, you know, poke around in each other's beliefs and that's where you make progress a lot of the time. And but there's no like right. that domain doesn't really exist anymore. It's like you go to Fox, you go to MSNBC or you listen to people in their little because it feels good to, to, you know, have your worldview stroked and reaffirmed. Um, mm-hmm. and Rogan just seems like one of the few places where there is authentic conversations taking place. So let's come, come back to that. So something that's really funny about that to me that's really interesting is actually, though, the the weird thing about it is he doesn't always have like this very civilized, the the, the expert isn't always the most civilized, like cautious, middle of the road expert either. Like a lot of times the expert is like even kind of extreme in their views or sometimes like (laughs) there's like this collection of like very hyper masculine scientists that I notice he'll have on who will just be like, Oh yeah. Like um, I can't remember that one guy's name. His name is like Peter or something. He's like one of the guys who like studies uh, weight gain Mm. and like longevity. And the guy is like, he was like the first one to swim between islands in Hawaii and like just a ton of things where it's all like he's like also talking to these other super expert, like these other alpha male people. Yeah. Who yeah. Are, so it's almost kind of interesting sometimes. Or I remember there was one time he talked to a um, a woman who was like she was studied Israel and Palestine, the conflict. But she actually like went there and was like in the fights and in like the groups. And it, so a lot of times her his choices are very extreme people. So uh, sometimes it's like they're conveying the extreme view and he's giving it a he's helping them talk about it in a way that's like palatable. And then he has this way of being kind of amazed by things. It gets you excited. You know what I'm talking about when I say oh, yeah. that. He, it's really, really interesting. It's very, it's hard to um, put put into words completely. But he gets like excited and into something that you, maybe you wouldn't necessarily get into or interested in. And so he's, I would say he's not just like this civilized. It's not like sitting down and listening to a conversation between like, you know, Sam Harris and uh, what's the guy? What's the physicist guy of the Doom Clock? Um, Lawrence uh, Krauss. Oh yeah, Lawrence, Lawrence Krauss. Yeah, yeah. So it's not it's not Sam Harris and Lawrence Krauss like sitting down and having this like very like okay your turn to talk your turn to talk. It's much more dynamic and active, and the Definitely. people that he interviews are oftentimes like all over the place. That's true. Maybe I could refine what I said more. It, it's like the sense of exploring the unknown. You get the sense that he's actively trying to figure out what he believes, and he's like poking around and like asking questions and genuinely kind of like stumbling through the darkness, like, well, what is this and what is that? And, oh my God, I can't believe that. It feels mm-hmm. like authentic in that sense, you know. And I'm sure part of that is him putting on a show, but I think a lot of it is real. I mean, and here's another thing. This is a kind of segue to a different topic, but they mm-hmm. change studios. This is a totally different topic. So, by the way, if you want to comment on the last part, uh, that's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. They changed studios and they, they had like, you know, Jimi Hendrix's mugshot behind them and like Frank Sinatra, maybe his mugshot. It was like kind of yeah. and like a lava lamp or something. I don't know. But then the new studio is kind of like it's more simple. And there's a American flag behind him. I remember yeah. not liking that at first. I was like, oh, this is kind yeah. of weird. I liked the hippie thing before. And this is like not quite yeah. that. But it's grown on me. And I kind of like the idea that like, you know, America, I think, is a bad image in all sorts of ways and just really so in, in a lot of ways. But I like the idea that there's this guy with an American flag behind him having these kinds of conversations and that that's going viral all over the world and like people are tuning in to listen to those conversations. I feel like that's mm-hmm. a good it's a good branding. It's like another American message that's a that's a positive message that I think is spreading around the world, mm-hmm. at least amongst like minded individuals that probably isn't receiving that much attention. Right. And do you think he put that there like on purpose or was it like a gift or something? Like what what is the American flag about, you think? I don't know the story, like if it was a gift or not, but I think it was certainly on purpose. I mean, I'm sure they had a discussion about like what do we want behind us, given Mm -hmm. how powerful or prolific the show has become. 
And I think I think I heard him talk about it once. I think he was just saying like, hey, I like America. As simple as that. Like we have things that are problematic, but uh, you know, it's a country that's supposed to be about freedom, and we've you know invented all this cool stuff. And I think there's like a positive ethos here, and so that's that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah, it it definitely divorces us from the traditional like America you know, F, F yeah, kind of like yeah. message of like, there's only one way of being patriotic that like his show in itself could also be patriotic. Yeah. I could definitely get on board with something like that. It is nice to, in an era of Trump and like stupidity to, you know, at the same, and was, let's talk about that actually really quick. Mm -hmm. um, his approach to Trump is really, really interesting because you can tell that he dances a line a lot of times like you can tell like obviously he thinks trump is like ridiculous and he'll even say that he'll say his line is like trump is a ridiculous human being you know yeah but it's almost like in order to even it out he'll always go back and start talking about how hillary was bad or how hillary would like have these uh physical problems where she would like pass out and stuff. so it's like he he knows his audience too but he never makes it apparent that he knows his audience yeah like there's a no point in the show where that he's actually sitting there like, oh my, you can, you never feel like he's saying something like, oh, the audience is really going to like this or not really going to like this, which is astonishing to think about when he, you know, he knows that each of his episodes is probably going to get like 10 million listens. Mm -hmm. it, it would like petrify the average person. Like if 10 million people listen to this podcast right now, I'd be very <laughs> self-conscious, right, about everything I said. But he's just like, oh, oh, yeah. I'll, do three, I'll do three hours every day where 10 million people are going to listen to what I have to say. <laughs> You know, it's, it's well, just I think it's, ballsy. I think it's gradual, too, if he was doing stand-up in tiny nightclubs when he was 20 or whatever, and then he was on Fear Factor. I'm sure it was just these gradual baby steps. And then with the podcast, like, when he started, nobody was listening. So I think, I imagine from his point of view, it's just been gradual baby steps to this point. And so maybe that lets him feel, like, less self-conscious. Yeah, I never feel like he's trying to be phony for the audience. You know, and, mm -hmm. and maybe he is. Maybe he's more, he's sort of more... Um, uh, he's engineering his questions in a way that I just don't pick up on, but I mm -hmm. kind of doubt it. It just seems like that would be more apparent. I feel like he's just, yeah, just actually expressing the feelings he does have about Trump and Hillary and people like that. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I guess I'm just more skeptical when mm -hmm. it comes to that than like, I, I think there has to be some thought process around like production, you know, and I know the episodes are live, so he's not cutting necessarily i mean he cuts the things into clips later on and cuts out some of the uninteresting parts i suppose but uh, to me if you're doing that for three hours every day there has to be this kind of like i know what's interesting i know what's not interesting i know how to like maneuver the guest into talking about something like even if you're not aware of it directly at a subconscious level you have to be doing that there's just yeah. no possibility but then again i mean maybe he's completely divorced from the advertising process yeah, and everything yeah. um so that's really interesting too um what do you think about the advertising um what advertising like his his advertising that he does he does like nearly eight minutes of it at the beginning of each episode does he yeah the audio version like the youtube version is not gonna have oh, that you know of what? course i always watch it on i always watch it on uh youtube i've never in fact i don't think i've ever listened to the audio version Really? Yeah. So, so what do you yeah. think about the advertisements? Well, I, I, it's pretty extensive. I mean, that that I would say, um, you know, at the beginning, he records up to eight minutes. I mean, he he does it each time individually. He, it's not like repeated from previous mm -hmm. episodes. And uh, I, I find it a little exhausting. But it's also like, again, it's a testament to like the hardworking thing that like he's willing to do this like seven to eight minutes of hustling to like make money, right? And it's also interesting, he sticks with the same advertisers that almost every other podcast does. Like at this point, he is so, I can't imagine like Coca-Cola wouldn't sponsor a show or, you know, something like more than like, you know, me undies yeah. or freaking like 1-800-Flowers or I mean, Harry, one Dollar Shave, Shave Club or any yeah. of these Audible, you know, these same couple of sponsors. It's really interesting to me that he's like that that part of the show has never evolved. And I think, again, that's like this consistency piece that he just doesn't want to, even though he could make probably dramatic more, amount more money if he had like a sponsor down on the show or sponsor stuff in the background. But he just refuses to do that. 
Yeah, I like that a lot. Do you think that is because he feels like if if he were to make a deal with, say, Coca-Cola, they would say, like, well, don't say the F word or, like, make some mm-hmm. tiny adjustment and that that would be kind of the beginning of the end in terms of its authenticity? Yeah, and I, probably also just that he is in a rhythm. You know what I mean? At this point, he's like, I know how to do this. I can do it every day. And, like, let's not change it if we, you know, don't have to. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. There's um, something about – there's a similarity between that and martial arts and working out and everything else, you know? Yeah, that's absolutely true. I want to ask you a question about what do you think the impact of his success will have on the mainstream media? <laughs> Any? I mean, do you think that they'll try to rip off that aesthetic, that stripped down aesthetic for primetime TV? Or do you think like, what, what do you think is going on? What do you think will unfold over the past, the next 10 years? Well, I think television is dead. I mean, at yeah. this point, or it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's in its death throes, let's say. Uh, so I don't think that's coming back anytime soon. So I don't think television is going to have the capability of starting to air three hour long interviews or anything, or at least the format wouldn't support that. Um, what I do think is he has incredibly influenced the world of podcasting. Like people try to replicate his show. I mean, I think even our show has probably been replicated, you know, to some degree has been informed by his podcast. And so to me, the, the goal the way he's influenced or the way he's supported is he's really shaped what a podcast can be and what it can turn into. And I don't know if you know that. I mean, like, I don't know if you guys remember or you remember this, Keith, but like podcasts a while ago, because I've been deep into podcasts probably since like the, you know, the first iPod um, Nano came out and you could like watch video podcasts. I mean, that was like back in like 2007, I think, when podcasts like first started. And uh, they used to be very structured and formatted. It'd be like, it would be very like radio. You know what I mean? We're going to have like this segment and then we're going to do this segment and then we're going to do this segment. I remember listening to a lot of tech podcasts where they would do like countdowns or like breakdowns where they would go through the news like topic by topic. Mm-hmm. And nowadays podcasts just don't do that anymore. They, they have these like very in-depth, long-winded discussions on topics that uh, you really have to be committed to listen to. And it's very the opposite of YouTube or the opposite of Snapchat, you know. So I think there was a there was a hunger for in depth conversations that wasn't being filled for mm-hmm. people who don't want people who aren't like watching TikTok videos or are watching Snapchat, you know, stories or Instagram stories. There was this hunger for like an in depth, intellectually stimulating thing. And I think Joe Rogan and probably a few other major podcasts have filled that void. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's fascinating. It's so cool the way you laid that out where when a new medium comes about, it just absorbs the structure from whatever the past medium was. And then Mm -hmm. over time, people begin to play around with it and they figure out like, oh, we don't really need this anymore. Like people did this on radio for reasons and this isn't radio. So we can throw this away. We can throw that away. And uh, and then, of course, you you know, hear from your audience and maybe they say they like the meandering conversation for an hour. So you give them more of that. Mm-hmm. And then over time, all of a sudden, this new medium has its own style, its own identity, like it's its own kind of subculture. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting that in this modern world where we have access to a billion things that kind of clutter up our consciousnesses, that people want to just hear a conversation. Like, it's crazy that it's something as simple as that, like two individuals talking for three hours is mm-hmm. like a soothing thing or something that people have a great interest in. It's like a yeah. throw, it's like a throwback to, I don't know, like early radio or, or to reading a novel, to something where you're engaged continually for a long period of time. Um, I think it's wonderful to see. I think it's great. The other thing, though, I think is it's also people don't have the skill set to do it anymore. To do what? You know, it's like to have those long-winded conversations where they really get into each other's worlds like that. Like when I get together with my friends, even if we're close and stuff, it's like it's really hard to maintain a conversation for more than like 20 minutes. Right. So the the fact that there's a skill set where people can really do that and you can listen to it. I think that that just is something in itself that uh, people really enjoy. Like everyone likes to be social, but nobody likes the awkward small talk that ha- you have to go through in order to build the relationship to become social yeah yeah right so i think that's part of it too is like joe rogan is so skilled at having a conversation at this point that it's just like eases that 
you know, like he, even the way he like sometimes starts the show is like once he's past the advertising, he'll be like, okay, we're here and boom, 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 boom. Like there's no awkwardness mm-hmm. at all ever mm-hmm. in the show. He has just completely surpassed that. So yeah. I don't know. I think that's part of it too, is that people just enjoy watching conversations that like go smoothly and go well. Cause I don't know about you, Keith, if you've ever listened to a podcast where there is like awkward awkwardness or weirdness it's almost painful oh yeah to listen to you're like oh god i'm dying and like listening to this right now so yeah it's funny there's a kind of dance that's taking place you know both partners are skilled and they know kind of how to move it like it, it reminds me of tennis back and forth mm-hmm. and back and forth and back and forth there's a rhythm to it um and it is like painful when people don't know what they're doing they don't know how to have that that rhythm there's a rhythm to it there's a rhythm to conversation um and mm-hmm. even if you don't quite know like what to say you can kind of just fill in the you can say something just to kind of meet the rhythm and keep it going. Um, but some people like are not good at that. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. But one thing I've heard Rogan say that I think is interesting, and I wonder how truthful it is, is he'll just say, like, people are way less dumb now than they used to be. And he'll say, you know, like, if you're living in the middle of Kansas before the Internet, like, mm-hmm. what did you have access to, really? Like, it's not, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been your fault. You know, like, life was simple. You're living on a plane and, like, you know, there's a little mm-hmm. city here or there. But now, no matter where you are, you have access to the internet. If you're a certain type of person, if you take the time, you can hear all these fascinating conversations happening. And so he seems to think that people are a lot different now than they were. And, you know, he's older than me, so maybe he has a perspective that I don't have. And, but it, and it's hard to say, too, because sometimes I think people are kind of zombies now with all technology. Mm-hmm. And people used to be better at talking and having conversations. And there was a, and a certain kind of intelligence that people used to have people who are now like in their 80s, then again, I kind of think he's right. I think maybe there is, I don't know, that there has been a huge uh, zeitgeist change that we're not really aware of because we're all in the middle of it. And I'm wondering, do you think the kinds of conversations that he's having really is having an impact on like a generation or like is changing the way people think and see the world? I, I mean, I think yes inherently only because it's hard to say let's say because i also hang out with pretty like highly educated people and i do wonder if you know i live in my own little bubble of where people are like listening to the science episodes and you know interested in that kind of thing versus i do wonder if there's a whole nother world where people maybe only listen to like the comedian episodes or don't listen to you know only listen to the ufc episodes and or don't listen to them at all you know and are just kind of caught up in the day-to-day reality television world so i you know i guess i would say both and right like yes Mm -hmm. he he probably is having an influence uh i wonder if it's the people who are already pretty intellectually engaged with life yeah like i do wonder if there's people who are who wouldn't be traditionally engaged in kind of these kind of intellectual conversations philosophical Mm -hmm. ideas who are now all of a sudden are because he has provided a gateway in uh, or not. I, I don't mm-hmm. know that to be my guess. My hope would be yes. You know, mm-hmm. my hope would definitely be so. What do you think? Um, it's hard to judge. It's really hard to judge for the same the same reason you just laid out. Um, I, there's got to be something to the idea that when you're connected to an ocean of information um, in interesting conversations, that that has some kind of effect on people on a wide scale. Um, but it's hard to measure that kind of thing, you know? Well, we've been talking for a while now. Do you have anything, any final thoughts about Rogan you want to throw out there before we start wrapping it up? Yeah, I think what the, the last thing that I would like to say is that I think he's, it's really interesting going forward where this whole, like his whole podcast is going to end up. Mm-hmm. Like, is this just going to be, is he going to become like a staple where for the next 25 years, he's going to be doing this? You know, and people are going to be like tuned in and listening. Is there going to be a point where he blows up and says something controversial? Right. So I, I guess yeah. I would ask the audience, like, where, where do people think this podcast is heading? What's going to happen inevitably? Is he just going to plug away until it's over, you know, at this point? Or is there going to be a point where he has to step down and retire? You know, he's at like whatever, almost like, is it like 1,400 episodes at this point or something crazy? I mean, it's like, you know, is he going to hit 10,000? Oh, you know, whoa. So, yeah. so I'm kind of curious, where does this go? Uh, what happens to it? Will there be Rogan scholars in the future who like jobs that just go down and like break <laughs> down all these conversations? I could totally see that thing being a thing like categorizing all like little scientific talks. You know, you probably become a millionaire yeah. just doing that. 
by pulling yeah. all the facts out. Yeah, I would love that. I'd love if he, I mean, obviously, as he gets older, he'll cut some stuff out. So I, I would be grateful if it was not the podcast. I think it'd be great if you just like, even if it was, even if it was once a week, you know, or a couple of times a week. Like if he just kept doing this as he got older and older and older, I think it'd be mm-hmm. such a blast to look back and you could see these chap, you, know, you could see him aging and see these different chapters of, uh, of his, you know, the second half of his life, basically. I think it'd be great. Yeah. And maybe he'll have, I, go ahead. No, and I was going to say, going back to your thing about the American flag, it is a, a uniquely American thing that this guy who was like a fear factor reality TV show host like willed himself to the top of the podcast charts through pure dedication. I mean, it's like a pure work ethic thing, yeah, right? Where yeah. if you produce that much and you work that hard to get that many guests, I mean, I can't even imagine the logistics behind the show yeah. to get all these guests and like schedule them out and have five, you have to have somebody every day. He never does one by himself. Yeah. Right. I mean, he has some frequent guests who pop in and pop out, but I mean, it's the logistics of it have to be insane. So, yeah. So anyway, what do you all think out there in YouTube world and uh, podcast world? Do you think, do we suck? Are we not, are we not even 1% of what Joe Rogan is in his pinky toe? No, we're trying, though. We're, we're going to turn the, turn the hustle up. Yeah, we got to turn the hustle up. If we are, we're going to have to produce an episode every single day. No, that'd be exhausting. I don't have that time to edit. If I had a professional editing team, I would definitely be down for that. But let us all know. Uh, so wrap up for that. So I am Kip Peter Antonio. And I'm Keith McIntosh. And have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.